Hi, welcome to How to Win, the webinar series from Vinces about how you beat your competitors in the RFP process in a complex bid. This is a series of 12 webinars that we'll be broadcasting over the first six months of 2018, each one designed to help you salespeople or bid managers improve what you're doing in the bid process to improve your win rates. Most of our clients used to win one in three, and with our help, they're all winning three out of four, 78%. And the, the reason they're doing that is because for the last 20 years, 20,000 presentations and 650 complex bids, we've been learning how to do each of these bits better so that we can have more of an impact on coaching our clients. So uh, last week's was why not how, getting the winning message. Today is about the winning solution. That's proving that you can deliver value, not capability. And we're going to talk about proof points. The formats of these uh, seminars are always the same. I'm going to give a 10 to 15 minute presentation about the subject based on what we've learned. And then we're going to have a Q&A, answer some of the questions that you've had. So if you're watching this live, thank you very much. Please, if you have a question, tweet it at me at any time. And they'll be captured on the iPad. And after the uh, presentation, you know, I'll uh, I'll step back on and, and uh, answer whatever questions we've been asked. But if you're watching the recording, please feel free to tweet at us as well. If you've got a question, just add into the tweet the name of the, um, of the webinar. In this case, value, not capability. If it's a question about last week's how, not why. And then we know which video you were watching when you asked the question and we'll be able to respond. And we will probably, we, if, you, if you tweet at us, we'll respond at you. But the idea is that we're keeping that all together uh, on that tweet page so that everybody can see what everybody else has asked and see our responses. And, you know, we can build up some, you know, interesting conversations around some of these afterwards. In order to help you, this at Vince's webinars will be up at the top of most of the slides so that you can answer every question. But let's get on with today's subject matter, which which is how do we make sure we have a winning solution and why you know why should we be thinking about value and not capability so um a brief recap from uh, the last webinar, um, we posed the question, why should they choose you rather than somebody else? And I give you an analogy we call what's in the box. So I can sell somebody a box without lifting the lid. If I put the lid on and say, it doesn't matter what's inside, here's why what's inside is of value to you. So be thinking about that, right? the value proposition. And then we also ended that seminar by talking about the definition of a value proposition, which is about what are you selling, you know, how are you, uh, why are they going to buy it off you, and how are you going to articulate that in a way that is compelling, consistent, concise, sorry, and consistent. And that if you pass all of those three C's, you have a compelling value proposition that's likely to increase your chances of winning. But having a good value proposition doesn't win you the deal. You need to be able to prove it. And here's the subject for today. Most people prove the wrong thing. Most people prove the capability. So they lift a lid on the box. Everybody looks inside the box and they go, how do we know that's going to work? And so the case studies become, well, here's where we've done this before, right? And here's how we know that we can deliver and execute this because we've done it before and here we are and all the rest of it. But what you're doing is proving your ability to deliver the solution. And that's the wrong thing. You need to prove your ability to deliver the value of the solution, not the solution. Make sense? So when it comes to proof, we think there are four sources of proof. So four things that we look for with our clients. If they're trying to prove a value proposition, you know, where do we go? How do we build a case that says, I can deliver this value, let me prove it to you. And there are five ways. And we have a mnemonic to help people remember it. The mnemonic is pilot, P for process, I for intellectual property, L for logic, O for operational, and T for testimonial. Pilot. To help you pilot or navigate your way through the proposal. Let's, I'm going to give you an example of each of these to help you to understand. So it doesn't matter what the benefit is. We're trying to prove the value of the benefit, not our ability to deliver the capability that delivers that benefit, right? Just 
prove that they get the value from it. So let's take the process bit first. And here's a real live example. In all of these, we've, uh, well, one of them is from others, but for most of these, I'm going to show you an example for each that is a real live example from a bid done by a client. Now, we've taken the name of the clients off to anonymize it because it's not really about, you know, this is how we proved IBM, you know, to delivered a, um, a project and why they won this one or anything like that. This is about just showing you or getting you to think about different ways of proving that you can deliver value. So let's look at a process argument first. And, and here's a process. Actually, this is from a, a medical organization. And what we're saying is that we can lower costs and improve efficacy because we have a better process for delivering an engagement um, with a patient. And so here's, a, here's how most healthcare providers um, you know, deliver the service. Uh, you get a doctor's appointment. At that doctor's appointment, you know, maybe you'll get prescribed some painkillers if you're in pain. And then if they don't work, the doctor will say, you know, take these painkillers, come back and see me in a week if it's still bad. Right? And then uh, you get another doctor's appointment and in the doctor's appointment, I go, okay, well, obviously there's something more serious. Let's have an MRR appointment and get the scan. Um, and then you have to come back after you've got the scan. And if that hasn't worked, well, then maybe the third doctor's appointment will actually deliver, you know, well, maybe you need some physical therapy here um, in the first place. Three different appointments, okay, uh, uh, quite a long-winded process, but you'll find this in any healthcare delivery network anywhere on the planet. And what our client does in order to streamline this, take out costs and improve um, healthy outcomes, is slightly different. On the first appointment, they do things slightly differently so that the patient is effectively automatically triaged through this process. We know at the first appointment that the patient is going to either need painkillers or need an MRI or need physical therapy. So the appointment is about ordering these into the most lightly order with one appointment and then forcing or encouraging the patient to follow that treatment plan. And if you do it in the right way, what you do is you reduce cost and improve the likelihood of outcomes early on. It's a much better process than this one. And what that means is we can take cost out your healthcare provision and improve the healthy outcomes in your patients. Right. That's a process proof. That's a way of proving the value, lowering your costs, improving your outcomes, but doing it with a different process because our process is better or leaner or faster or whatever. Process proof. That's the P. The P in pilot. Now let's look at the I in pilot. Now, I is about intellectual property, and the problem is sharing a client's intellectual property is probably a little bit um, difficult in this kind of webinar, so I'm going to show you an example from us, which isn't about selling us, it's just about demonstrating what we mean when we say intellectual property proof. And so, one of the things we offer is um, we, we want to help improve the orals presentation at the back end of the bid. And in order for the order for the orals presentation to be effective, it has to be three things. Number one, it has to be impressive because first impressions count. If you, you, unfortunately, if you walk in your presentation looks like you made it up on the way there, that's the way that that will be the impression they get of your organisation. And um, your presentation needs to be engaging because if they're not paying attention to it, then there was no point delivering it. So how do you make sure your presentation is engaging? And then finally, it has to be memorable because they don't make the decision there and then, they make it next week, next month, next year. And so you need to deliver all of those three. And the way we help you deliver all those three is that we have three bits of intellectual property that ensure it. The impressive bit is something we call objective quality standards. It's a set of rules that we've built up over 20,000 business to business sales presentations and nearly now probably a million PowerPoint slides. We know what works and what doesn't and what will really impress people. Engaging is a technology we call visual cognitive dissonance. That's a way of designing slides so that people actually pay attention. And if they're paying attention, therefore they're engaged. And then we have a technology we call passive mnemonic processes, which is about how do we get people to process the information in a way that makes them remember and recall it. Now, each bit of this 
is intellectual property that we've developed, we've refined, we've invested 20 years of experience, and in most cases, we've also worked with uh, UCLan and other universities to ensure that academically it's sound and that we have proven academic papers that show that if you deploy all of these, you improve recall on content and presentations by 350%. That's an academic intellectual property proof that we can make your presentations more impressive, engaging, and memorable. And the so what for that is if your presentations are more impressive, what happen, engaging and memorable, what happens is they're more effective and more effective presentations win more deals, do so at higher margin, and do so with less time. And that's how we prove it. So that's the intellectual property. Look in your organization for where you have intellectual property of your own, stuff that you've developed in-house, maybe it's stuff that you've branded, maybe it's stuff that you trademarked, maybe it's patents that you have. If these are things that you have that nobody else have and they can prove value, not capability, then there's a good chance they can be used as proof. Now let's look at a logical proof. Logical proof is a little bit uh, fudgy sometimes. It's A plus B equals C. And if I can prove A and prove B, people are going to assume C. But sometimes it's not quite that clear. But let me give you a good example of a logical argument that might not hold water if you thought about it too much. Um, here's the win rates of clients that are not using our services. I'm winning at 30%. Here's the win rate of clients that are using our services. That on the face of it seems fairly compelling. Right? If all of these organizations are all winning 75% of their deals, uh, whereas they used to win a third, then everybody's going to sit there and say, well, there's a good chance they can do it for us. Now, here's where the logic breaks down. We are not the reason all of these people are winning at 75%. They are winning at 75% because they're really bloody good at what they do, and they've got the price right. And then we're able to help them articulate it. But it doesn't matter how good we are, if they are three times the cost, they're going to lose. And if they cannot deliver and execute, they cannot, you know, a good presentation isn't going to make any difference. So this 75% is not a guarantee. If you come to us and you don't have the price right and you can't execute, it doesn't matter how good the presentation is, you're not going to win 75% of your deals. So whilst this is a logical proof, Here's what we've done before, we can do it again. It feels believable and it will persuade people. Bear in mind, it doesn't have to be absolutely watertight an argument for it to be proof. That's a logical argument. Fourth one then is operational. Operation is a bit difficult to describe sometimes because what we mean is that there's something unique or different about the way you operate and deliver the service that makes that service of more value than getting it from somebody else. And this is an example, again, from uh, the uh, medical market in, uh, in the US. And I'm going to give you an example of three things that support this operational argument. W one is a process, one is some technology, and one is the resilience behind it. And then what we're really trying to argue here is that the service that people are going to buy from this organization um, will fail if every time um, an employee picks up the phone to use it, it isn't there. It has to be available. If it's not available, you won't get traction, you won't get utilization, and therefore you won't get any benefits. So how do we make sure that it is always available? So here's the first argument, and it's a process argument. When the employee wants to have an appointment with the doctor, here's what needs to happen behind the scenes. The first thing that needs to happen is somebody needs to make sure that the employee can access, a, uh, in this case, a primary care physician who is licensed to deal with it. That licensed GP then has to be available, sat at their desk in and you know, currently at work. Then there has to be some kind of matching and forms a queue so that the potential GP who's going to answer the call here has the information in front of them to be able to take the call. And then they have to view the uh, electrical, uh, electronic medical record um, so that the GP, before he speaks to the employee, can actually look at the notes so that the call can start at the right place and not with they say, so why are you calling me? But, oh, so are you calling me because of this? And then Often, right, there may be some time here, and this doesn't happen, so it has to be able to do all of that every kind of seven seconds so that you permanently match the two together. 
That's the first bit. You have to get the process right in order to ensure that somebody is always available. But it's not just the process, you also have the technology. All of that matching stuff, you know, there's a limit to how much of it can be done if it's been done on a manual process. If somebody is sitting there with a spreadsheet and a list of doctors and a list of patients and trying to match all of these people up and check all the stuff, then you can't do it that many times. If you've only got 50 calls a day, you don't need a computer system, you just need a you know, big room and a lot of people and you can probably sort it. But once you get up to the kind of levels that our client is using, 5,000 of these calls every single day, you you cannot do it without some sophisticated technology underpinning that process. And that's a bit of AI and that's a bit of infrastructure and that's a huge investment, in this case, over a couple of hundred million dollars worth of investment in getting the technology right so that from the patient's experience, pick up the phone, doctor is on the end of the phone. That's the technology piece of this. And then the final one is the resilience is that technology all has to be in two different service centers. So there's two different call centers, two different types of the country, co complete disaster recovery. And actually the data is put on a third site so that there's fully, you know, it, there's, there's no loss of service. If one of these sites goes down, all of the data is always available. And the combination of having a completely resilient technological solution that's based on a process that works is that it is always available every time that person wants to speak to a doctor, it will happen. Now that's a complicated proof, right? But what it leaves you with is the absolute certainty that operationally this organization can deliver and that there will be no loss of service. And obviously the benefit of that is if it's always available, you'll get the adoption, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we mean by an operational proof. And we'd be sitting there saying, so how do you do it? This is in fact about what's in the box. This, But this is about what's in the box and how what's in the box actually helps you drive not the capability, but the value of the capability. That's the O for operational. Next one then is testimonial. Uh, we put this one at the end because it's where most people go first. Um, and actually it's perhaps not the most, or often it's not the most compelling. And the reason is testimonials fall into three different categories. Obviously, first person, second person, and third person testimonial. Here is first person testimonial. This is me telling you that our clients win 76% of the time, three out of four. That's great, but whether or not it's persuasive or not depends entirely on whether you think I'm telling the truth. And as there is a unfortunate habit of salespeople, you can tell when we're lying because our lips are moving. There is always some doubt that this might not be true, that I might finesse it or I might be spinning it or that it might not actually deliver it. So first person testimonial, we've done this before, here's what we've got is persuasive, but not nearly as persuasive as second person. Second person testimonial is where we're not using my data. It's not me saying I win, it's clients. So here's what IBM were winning before we got involved, less than 30%. And then in the following two years, we moved them to 50% and to 70%. This is referenceable. We have a list of IBM deals, a list of IBM contacts. You can phone them up and say, did we do this? Did we help you win 11 out of 15 of your deals? Answer is yes. And because it's verifiable by the client, second person, it's much more compelling. But most clients, if they've spent a lot of money on something, are not going to turn around and go, no, it was horrible. No, it didn't work. And so, and, I, and if there was a client like that, I wouldn't tell you who they were. I would tell you, where's my best case study? And, you know, who are my friends? And who are the people who are going to say the things I want them to say? And everybody kind of knows that now. So second person testimonial, why it is quite compelling, isn't as compelling as third person testimonial. Third person testimonial is where I've got somebody who's completely independent. He's not a customer, he's not a friend, right? He is completely independent. Could this could be newspaper, could be the FT, it could be, you know, any kind of third party. In this case, it's the Chartered Institute of Marketing in the UK. This is the, uh, this is the chairman. Yeah, he attended one of the courses, saw what we did, and had very nice things to say about it. It doesn't really matter what it is. The point is, there's no ax to grind for this guy. He's not making anything out of it. He's not invested in it. It's third party because it's the CIM. Could be anybody. This is trade journals. This is newspapers. This is, you know, organized. This is Royal College of Physicians. It's those kind of people that, you know, not Gartner, 
right? Because you can pay Gartner to say whatever you want, but that kind of thing. Somebody who is independent and is going to independently assess your ability to deliver the value of what you're doing. Third person testimonial, really important. So clearly this is an ordered list, right? Third person is more powerful than second, which is more person powerful than first. First is easy to get. I can make it up myself. Second is relatively easy to get. Go ask a client for a quote. Third is manna from heaven. If you can find this, this is probably the most important proof, particularly if it's then backed into the rest of Pilot and so that you're doing it. And one of the tricks when we're putting presentations together or writing executive summaries is to find the not just the one, but maybe the two or sometimes three of these that put together create a compelling argument. So here's a process, right? here's a logical proof, and here's a testimonial at the end that proves that if you put this process in, then logically it'll deliver it to you. And so sometimes we combine these, but when you're looking for proof of value, these are the things you should think about looking. Have you got a process? Is this a MIP? Is there a logical deductible argument? Is there something you're doing operationally? And finally, have you done it before? Can we prove it? Can we get a testimonial? Those are the questions we ask when we're helping people write their executive summaries and produce their presentations. Because we know it works. It takes people from winning one and three to winning three and four. So just a quick warning or a quick heads up, uh, the webinar in two weeks time will be about point not pros, about making sure the winning proposal, in this case, it's gonna concentrate on the written word of the executive summary and the RFP, what needs to be in there. Uh, the, the key point here is it doesn't matter how good your proposal is, if it isn't read, it isn't gonna have any um, impact on the sale at all. Now we're going to move into the Q&A. Remember, if you've had a question, tweet it at Vince's webinar. If you're watching the recording, still tweet it at Vince's webinar. Um, and we obviously won't respond right now because uh, maybe you're asking it in a month in the future, but we will respond and tweet it back to you. Uh, for now, um, I'll be back in a minute and we'll discuss some of the questions that we've had over the last 10 or 15 minutes. Thanks for watching. Bye. Hi everyone, uh, this is actually Alice here, not Nikki. Um, you get me today um, instead of Nikki um, because she uh, has been uh, called to the airport um, for a last minute pitch um, and so is en route um, to the US um, at the moment. Um, uh, I'm Nikki's business partner, um, my name is Alice um, and I'll be here to answer any of your questions um, in Nikki's absence. Um, so feel free to uh, get in touch with the questions um, and we'll go from there. Ah, so folks, we've had another question, uh, which is, um, does Pilot uh, also apply to other communications that you put in front of the client? Um, and the answer to that one is yes, most definitely. And um, you know what Nikki was demonstrating in the webinar was examples that we've lifted from real presentations that we've developed. Um, but the same type of thinking and rigor around the proof and evidence of the value that you drive should also be weaved into the written communications. So when you're thinking about writing to the client or responding to an RFP or producing a summary or an executive summary, and um, you should be approaching those with pilot in mind, just like you would for the presentation. Um, and that just doing it at the presentation is not as powerful as doing it throughout the whole sales process. And um, so the answer there is yes, most definitely. And, um, you know, this needs to be uh, a way of approaching how you think about what you put in front of the client um, in terms of pilot, not just um, what you put in front of them in the live presentation towards the end of the process. Okay, so it uh, looks like that's all of the questions for now. Um, if you think of something uh, at a later date, of course, you can tweet us. And um, I think we'll leave it there for now. Hope you enjoyed the webinar and um, hope you stay in touch. Thanks, folks.